Hello everyone, the day is Thursday, August 15, 2019, and this is the week in charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I am humbled by your presence. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, I can always sum it up, or I can easily sum it up by saying all predictions are about the future. Man, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, what do we talk about? Well, I think let's continue to talk about well, we've been talking about, given the conditions of the market, I think it's very important that we continue to focus on the overall market. If you have any questions, if you don't mind, just to save my ADD from kicking in, keep them to the slides when we get to the end of the slides, which we should do fairly quickly this week. Feel free to ask about anything you want. Questions requiring a lot of thought will be covered and the Q&A in the members area. And quick questions, obviously, I'll get to right away. And in some cases, we'll get to them in future week of charts if there's a lot going on. Your favorite stock picks, hold off until we get to the actual charts. And that's, again, for your benefit. Also, and again, for your benefit too, just ask about one stock at a time. That way I know which ones I've covered, which ones I have not. All right, so what are we talking about? Well, once again, let's keep on the topic of market timing simplified. And then I think it's also important to stay on winter watch. Now, a while back, I was a little, I hate to use the word bearish because I hate to label myself, but I was a little concerned about the market. And then we saw some signals that suggested winter was delayed. We had a little bit of a breakout, but then we came right back in. So the question is, are we back into the woods? Now, let's do a quick update on the TFM. 10% system. I beat the dead horse on this, but to my surprise, this is one of the things that I've received a ton of questions on, so that's why we cover it so much. Plus, I think it's a fairly, I don't want to use the word robust, but it's a fairly cool system, especially based on its simplicity, and, and I'll flesh that out in just one second. The designer's intent behind the system is to stay long as long as the market is healthy, and then get out of the way when it's not. Now, I define healthy as a market being within 10% from its 50-week closing high. So, as I often say, if a market should go from A to C and B is in between, it doesn't have to pass through B along the way. Not that you want to just blindly buy a market at B, although we do have an IPO pattern that is buy at B. You actually buy at B. And, in other words, when a stock on an IPO that is, is making a new closing high. And I'm going to show you a similar setup in just one second about uh, regarding that as soon as we get done talking about the markets. But anyway, as long as a market is within 10% of its 50-week closing high, that seems like it's pretty healthy. And the whipsaw filter is that the last two-week lows have to be greater than the 50-week moving average. That's the entire buy portion of the system. So you need two weeks of Landry Light, and you need to be less than 10% away from the 50-week closing high. And then, so what do you exit? Well, it's a long-only system, although I have seen some cases where it might show some promise on the short side. But for now, let's just keep it long-only oriented. You want to exit when the market is 10% or more away from its 50-week closing high, and and here's our whipsaw filter, the close is less than the 50-week moving average. We don't wait for that downside Landry light because if you do, and as you know, markets take the escalator up and the elevator down. So if you do wait for that two weeks of Landry light, the majority of the move could possibly be over and or you could get out at much, much, much lower levels. So again, you can see that we went green way back in March, and that was a buy signal. Now keep in mind, this is a weekly chart, and the reason that little ribbon at the bottom went green was because two things happened. Number one, you were less than 10% away from the 50 week closing high, and you had two weeks of Landry light. Now I'm gonna zoom all this in 
in just one second anyway. But you can see right here, this is what percentage you are away from the 50-week closing high. And you can see you have one, two weeks of Landry light. So that's your buy. The next week, you're probably thinking, boy, was I stupid to buy into this market. But then it did take off a little bit since then. And I'll show you the spreadsheet in just one second. So that's the entire system in a nutshell. Pretty easy stuff. So let's continue on and see what we can glean from all this. So again, this is what it looks like zoomed in. You can see you have the lows greater than the 50 week moving average. And notice up here for weeks, you were within 10% of the closing high. And notice right here, you're actually at the new closing high. So that reads zero. Your new closing high is set here. I have some indicators that plot this on the chart and that'll make that a little bit more clear in just one second. And you can see since it's gotten long, you had a, a week or so underwater and then it's rallied nicely. But for the most part, you've been positive based on the system since it went long back in March. Now, here's the interesting thing, though. We were up as much as 8% based on the last signal. And let me just draw that in for you. So the last signal, again, was in March, March 1st, right here. Okay, that's your in. And then we don't know what our out is going to be just yet. So this is actually based on the 15th. And this down here is based on the 15th. But you can see that we're only up 1% based on that last signal. And we've been in 160 days based on the last signal. The high for the move, I just kind of eyeballed it earlier, but it's right about 8%. So quite a bit of that has been given up, obviously, based on the drawdown since. And I don't want to go into too many details, but the designer's intent for this system is to get out of the way when the market goes into a prolonged sell-off or bear market and to be long as long as it doesn't appear to be in a bear market. And I call the diaper change moments stealing a line from Ian McActivy, and I don't think he would mind me stealing that from him. He was a good guy. He was funny as hell. I wish I could be half as funny as him in presentations, but I could strive. But anyway, he called a diaper change moment when bad things happen, black swan type events and such. But you can see right here, we sold off 44% in 2000. And remember back then, NASDAQ went down 78%, I think, if memory serves. And then you can see back here again in 2000 and... What was this? This is a 2008 bear market. The market lost over 52% of its value. Now, what's kind of interesting in this, and again, I said I didn't want to spend too much time, but I know we have some new people in here today, and we might have some new viewers. But obviously, if you're buying hold, and I only went back to 1988, I've looked at this thing historically, and it looks like it works pretty good. Would have gotten you out in 29, would have gotten you out before the crash in 87. No guarantees in life, obviously, so you can't ask for your money back. It's a free system anyway. <laughs> but obviously, buy and hold, you would be long for about 31 years based on this particular spreadsheet when we started looking at this. And I picked the late 80s just because we had a nice bull market, and then we had a couple of bear markets since. But it would be fun to go back in time and just see what happened further back. But I'm sure are fairly sure that it would continue to be robust. So again, 31 years in, and if you were trading the system, you would be in the market for 24 and a half years. Now that doesn't sound like that much of a difference, but that's 6.31 years out of the market. So 20% of the time you would be out of the market and look at some of these 20%, 10% move, 44% move, 52% move, 11% move, like I said last week, 11% move, that's nothing to sneeze at because 
let's say you had a million dollars saved up for retirement and you lost 11% over a short period of time, you would be a hurting pup. You would say, wow, I just lost $110,000. That's a substantial amount of money. Now, obviously in 2008, you lose a half a million down to half a million. That's not a good thing. I won't get into that too much. But anyway, pretty robust. I guess, I don't know if the robust is the right word, but it certainly isn't too noisy, being, meaning getting you in and out too much. It doesn't have too, too much lag. It has some lag in it, which I'll point out in one second. But the good thing is, so far, knock on wood, it's kept you out of every major bear market. Okay, let's take a look at what that looks like. Now, what I've done with this chart is two things. One, I put the green line below, or applied this green line. So this green line that in this particular case is mostly below the prices is simply 90% of the new closing high for 50 weeks. So the blue line on top, you can see is gonna be equal to the new closing high when the market is making a new closing high, 50 week closing high. So notice right here, you make a new 50 week closing high and then you sell off a bit. So this 50 week closing high stays in place until and unless when you begin to exceed it as you began to do back here. And then you can see this line stair stepped higher. The line below it is simply 10% away. So if you measure from here to here, this line is 10% below, or another way of looking at it is this line is 90% of the line above it, however you want to look at that. So you can see as long as you're above the green line, you're less than 10% away from the 50 week closing high. When you go more than 10% away from the 50 week closing high, the price obviously is below the green line. Now I'm gonna flesh out a few more things. This is gonna make a lot of sense in just one second. All right, so let's take a look at this. So like I said last week, as long as it's green and the ribbon below, and the ribbon basically is just a system rules. And all I'm saying here is, hey, we're within 10% we're within of the 50-week closing high and two lows are greater than the 50-week moving average. Now, notice we got the warning signal when what happened? Well, price intersected the 50-week moving average, but then the uptrend continued. We go back to relax. We had another warning way back in October of 2018, when what happened? Well, we dropped below the 50 week moving average, and then the sell signal came in when what happened? We closed below that 50 week moving average and were more than 10% away from the 50 week closing high. Well, it stayed bearish for a while, it was neutral right away for a second. It looked like, the, looked like it was gonna be a whipsaw, but then we had a pretty substantial sell-off. We gotta get ready when things began to improve. And then we got a buy signal when what happened? Two weeks above the 50-week moving average and less than 10% away from the 50-week closing high. That's it. Now, the next week we got a warning because as soon as we bought the following week, we're underwater because the market dropped back below its 50 week moving average. Then we can go back to relax. Now that relax is relax, ha ha implied. We had a warning back in June when things were getting a little dicey. And so far, we're still in relax mode. Everybody's relaxed, right? Well, there's some daily signals that are triggering that we'll take a look at that we might want to be concerned about. But so far, based on this longer term market timing system, we're still in relax mode. As you can see, I shaded in the bullish and bearish ribbons, left the neutrals blank, and then added in the reds. But you can see that you would have stayed long for a long time from July or 
maybe let's let's go further back from April all the way to March of 2018. It went neutral for a while, but you, and you would still be long. You're still long when it's neutral, and then you would resume relaxing, haha, into September, and then obviously. You got a warning when it went neutral, things went south for a while, and all of that is in the spreadsheet if you want to, when you see the recording of this, you can take a look at that spreadsheet. You got your buy signal, again, it went neutral right after, and then it stayed bullish and neutral since. And so far, so good. Pretty good run from the last buy. Well, let me rephrase that. Pretty good run since it turned neutral. And you're only up 1% since the last buy. So this is what it looks like longer term. Bearish and neutral in bear markets and bullish and neutral in bull markets. There are some whipsaws along the way, like death and taxes, as I often say. But for the most part, you can see it stayed long during bull markets and short or out, I should say, because we're not actually shorting with this during bear markets. Although it is showing some promise. So pretty, pretty simple, pretty simple, easy stuff. But you'd be surprised at how much help this will give you. So I have a few of you that are beginning to take this kind of stuff. You know, I love it when you take the ball and run with it. So that's awesome. And a few of you have beginning begun to implement this stuff into some longer term market timing. And I just think that's awesome. And it, it, this type of stuff can keep you from chasing your own tail. So it's like, oh, geez, the market's beginning to sell off, as we say in Fargo. But until you get a signal, a longer-term signal, that is, there's no need to panic. I know. Ha ha. So as I've said quite a bit, it's it's just another tool, but possibly the start of something bigger based on what some of you guys are doing with your research. So that's just awesome. If you're under a buy, then focus mostly on the long side. If you're under a sell, then you want to be super duper selective on the long side and maybe consider a short or two. Now, the designer's intent is for the overall market. And 10% is based on, based on the general overall market volatility basis, the S&P 500. For other markets, it might be higher or lower depending on the volatility. Now, one thing I would probably suggest you do is I wouldn't use this too much in stocks, although I've been experiment with it, experimenting with it, and it does have a little merit. But I would rather use this in something like a sector. Obviously, it's, it's designed around the S&P 500, but it would also work fairly well in the NASDAQ. You're 10% number might be slightly higher. And the Russell 2000, again, your 10% number might be a little slightly higher. But I think where it might show some additional promise would be in individual sectors and ETFs. Individual stocks, I think, could be too volatile, and the volatility too, could increase too fast, and that could create some problems. Whereas in sectors and commodities, there might be some merit there. So I'd rather use the core methodology when it comes to individual stocks and then using the overall market as part of your analysis. And I'm going to show you just one second. I've got an experiment going on, a live experiment with the Bitcoin ETF. Well, I don't know if it's a Bitcoin ETF, but GBTC. And we'll talk about that in one second. Before we do that, let's talk about some other simplified systems. And first of all, the net net. Is the price higher, lower, or about the same as it was? And I find it interesting that someone said that the NASDAQ was up like 17%. I'm like, what? on TV this morning because everybody's a little freaked out about the markets. Well, you go back about a year in time, and we're down 4% in the NASDAQ, and that's not counting today's prices. That's as of yesterday's close. So I find that kind of interesting 
that they're like, oh, don't panic, don't freak out. We're, you know, we're up 17% in NASDAQ. And then in the S&P 500, he said, oh, yeah, we're up a bunch there too. Well, when I look at my charts, going back roughly a year, I see that we're down 3%. So if you think about that from a psychological perspective, yeah, you might be feeling pretty good since January, but longer term, you're a hurt and pop. Your portfolio is actually underwater if you're a, an investor buying whole type for the last year. So that has to be putting a little bit of pressure on you. All right. Other simplified market timing. This is just simply Landry light, meaning that the lows are greater than the 50 week moving average. And that gives you upside Landry light, which is green. And you can see during great bull runs, it stays green or mostly green. And during bear markets, it stays red or mostly red. Now, one thing to glean from this is that market spends most of the time going up but that's a rather poor argument for buy and hold the histogram above the price chart is simply the number of days that price has gone without intersecting the 50-week moving average and you can notice that when it intersects it it goes down to zero and when there's land your life to the downside it turns red now, there's a couple little spots in here, and these are the same spots where we had some signals in the TFM system. But there's a couple spots where it turned red, and some of these were nothing to sneeze at, as I often say that. 2050, 2016 sell off, or whatever you want to call that, was fairly substantial, and it was nearly 18% of memory serves in the Russell 2000 from something like a daily bow tie. So that's nothing to sneeze at. And you can see that, again, we resumed the uptrend. They had a little spill back in late 2018, and then it turned green again when, or it turned green again as we recovered. Now, the weekly bow ties, as I've said ad nauseum, you get weekly bow tie sell signals, or when you get a weekly bow tie sell signals, a major signal off of all time highs, it pays to pay attention. The last one we had did not trigger. The one before that was the 2050, 2060. I got a little bearish back then, as you know. And it really didn't materialize, but the Russell did sell off 18% of every service. That was from the weekly bow tie, which was a little late to catch up. Obviously, a daily is going to catch up a little quicker. And then the major bear markets, I'm sorry, the major bull markets that we've had in between especially the one in 2002, 2003, because the market made a nice, long, fat bottom for two years. But that that weekly bow tie got you in pretty quick there. As I often preach, patterns or fractal, the market recently made an all-time high, and the moving averages flipped from uptrend proper order, 10 graded, 20 graded, and 30, 10 simple, 20 EMA, 30 EMA, and flipped to downtrend proper order and then sold off fairly hard from there. Now, we now have a daily bow tie for those keeping score in the S&P 500, and that triggered yesterday. Now, the reason it didn't trigger earlier was, if you back the chart out a few days, you'll see that the moving averages were actually equal and the 20 was not below the 30. Now, it was also, even though the bow tie wasn't official, it was pretty close. And then we also had a first thrust down before that bow tie crossed over. Remember, you're going to get the first thrust first, and then bow tie sometimes can be a little bit later confirmation. If the market rolls over really slow, you will get both at the same time. But in order for the bow tie mechanically to trigger, you need two things. One, you need the bow tie in and of itself, the crossing, the tight crossing of those moving averages. 
obviously over three or four periods. It could be three or four hours for an hourly chart, three or four days for a daily chart, three or four weeks for a weekly chart, and then a higher high and a lot higher low. And then obviously when that low of that pullback gets taken out like it did yesterday, you look to short or certainly get out of the way. My wife bought me this a couple of weeks back. I was a little nervous. This is the housewarming gift for my new office, which I hope to be in in about a month or so, maybe a little bit longer. Kind of feel like, what was the name of that show? Two weeks, two weeks. <laughs> When's the cabinets going in? Two weeks. Okay. When's the floors going in? Two weeks. We'll see. All right, a couple of random thoughts. Use your own portfolio as a microcosm of something much bigger. Now, we are trend following morons and we have gotten stopped out of everything coming into this slide and a lot of that happened before the market actually went on to make new highs so this could be really fascinating especially if you're a trend follower and the market begins to turn in its trend a lot of time especially these high beta stocks that we have, in other words, more volatile than the overall markets, these momentum names, they tend to get hit first when the market begins to slide or even before the market begins to slide. Now, I don't want to digress too far, but for a while, there's just not enough time to do everything I want to do. And it's like I wake up every morning and I write these morning pages, like three pages of morning pages, and then I start looking at my to-do list and then that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. All these ideas, all this to do. I guess it's good that I'm not dead yet, and I won't, you know, as long as I kind of feel like, well, maybe if I get everything done, then my life is done. But uh, anyway, there's so many things that I want to do. One of the things I was doing a while back, I would love to have continued it, continued it I do have a point in all this, believe it or not, is it, I was – running a model portfolio not on not with real money but just a, a s and g type of thing and i did it for three or four years where i would only buy a stock if it made new highs ideally on an expansion of range and i kept a portfolio of 100 stocks and it was an equal investment of 10,000 each so it's a million dollar portfolio Obviously, this thing printed money as long as we were in a pretty good bull market, and that's not a big shocker. And I just wanted to kind of prove that something like stupidly simple could work. But in the process, I learned a lot. What was amazing is this thing would get whacked 2 3%, sometimes more, and the market would be making new highs. And it's like, well, what the hell is going on here? And then within a day or two, sometimes a little bit longer, the overall market would begin to tank. So that was kind of an interesting live, but not real money experiment that I did. And it worked out pretty cool. And I'd love to, maybe someday I'll staff up and have somebody run all these models and keep an eye on them to see what they're saying. But it was a pretty cool thing. Now, the one thing that I did do was reaffirm what I often see in my own portfolio and in the model portfolio. The model portfolio is a trading service, which I do match in my own accounts, but I do sometimes take some stocks outside of it. So my own personal portfolio is down to just GSX, which we'll look at in just one second. And then I have a token position and GBTC. GBTC is the closest thing to a Bitcoin ETF. They're trying to get these Bitcoin ETFs approved, but they're running into a lot of roadblocks. So this company, which is a pink sheet company, I guess maybe that's why it's not an official ETF. They're not meeting all the regulations. So buyer beware. And it also trades, by the way, with a huge premium. And I just wanted to put it on a position, see how it trades, and also follow along with a simple trend following system such as the TFM 10%. And in this case, it's 30%. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. Anyway, long story endless, my whole point here is that the model portfolio, which I track carefully and I do trade my own account with, is flat. 
And my personal portfolio is down to just one stock. Technically, GBTC is Bitcoin and not a stock. Now, the other thing to do or be cognizant of is to listen to the database when it speaks. Now, when the market was making new highs, if you go in and look at the service archives, and I'll publish those soon on the website. There, If you're on the service, you can actually look at them. But when the market was making new highs, I wasn't finding any new setups. Now, number one, that's normal because the methodology requires a pullback. But in the back of my head, I was also wondering, well, wait a minute. Is the database trying to tell me something more? As I've said, ad nauseum back in 2007, I couldn't find a long to save my life. And the market was just kind of bumping along brand new highs. I reached a point where I actually apologized to my clients for recommending some shorts. And then we later found out why that was so. So very important to listen to the database when it speaks. I haven't had a setup in quite a while. The Landry list, which is my personal watch list, which I publish daily in the service, has been really skinny for quite some time. In more recent times, though, we have been seeing quite a few shorts, and so that list has begun to grow. And now we're seeing some golds setting up. So a lot of shorts that have started showing up in the Landry list and things that can trade contrary to the overall market are not always held hostage to the overall market like golds again. Now, again, people ask me often about the 10% system in other markets. I don't think it would work in stocks. I think the volatility changes too quick. But as I said earlier, in something like an index or a commodity, I think there's definitely something there. However, you would have to adjust to the volatility. So this horizontal line, I should have moved this up to 30, because believe it or not, Bitcoin, based on its volatility, requires about a 30% stop. But dang, that's too crazy. Well, it is what it is, okay? And again, you see this blue line dropping here. That's because the 50-week high, in this particular case, we're looking at a daily chart. That's because the 50-day high is dropping. So applying the 50, in this case, 50-day system at 30%, okay, and using a 50-day moving average, you want to be long as long as you have two bars above, like you have right here, the 50 day moving average and you're above the green line in other words within 30 percent which i won't be able to draw it straight but you get the idea this is kind of the 30 percent line up here so this would have gotten you long back in march actually back in february and you'd still be long the gbtc so i have a very small token position here the problem with the gbtc the Bitcoin Investment Trust, I think it's, it's a Wolf or Gray or something, I forget the name of the company that puts these out. But it trades at a big premium to Bitcoin, and that can get a little dangerous. And again, I just have a token position so I can follow along with the stock version of the Bitcoin and be able to show you things like this. My main positions in Bitcoin and crypto or with the exchanges, and as I often say, I use that term loosely, and I make little air quotes when I say it in the air. Trust them about as far as I can throw them. Do a little research, and you can see a lot of these so-called exchanges, air quotes are being made, have gotten into a lot of trouble. Anyway, so that's the TFM 10%. In this case, it's the TFM 30% with Bitcoin. Now, earlier I said I was down to one stock, last man standing. So this is the only stock that I have in my portfolio. That is a stock, that is. And the high was set on first day of trading. And those who are in the Facebook group, and you do have to be, the Facebook group is free, but you do have to be a current gold subscriber to my website. And that's cheap. It's $47 a month. If you don't have $47, you shouldn't be trading. I'm half kidding. 
So I'm not. Anyway, you can see that the high was set on day one for the first week. That's day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. So our buy at B and our Landry Light Systems say that one, you need a new closing high, okay? And if the high is set on day one, it must also be above the day one high. So that's gonna be our buy line. And then we need to also have, if we're doing the five day, and I need to come up with a name for this, five day Landry Light IPO system, the low has to be greater than the five day simple moving average. Now, if you go to the uh, if you go to the members area, we talk a lot about this. We talk a lot about this in the Q and A, and we fleshed it out quite a bit. But the general system is, or general setup is, low greater than the five day SMA and new closing high. And if the high was set for the first week on day one, you also have to close above that high. And I like to throw out things for my peeps, and you guys have been throwing out some good stuff for me too, so thank you very much. But on July 25th, about an hour before the close, I threw out that, hey, I'm taking a look at this GSX as a possible trade, and quite a few of you guys were along for the ride. So that's kind of, it's been a blast. By the way, I've been having a lot of fun with you guys. So continuing on with this GSX example, let's take a look at the trading plan. And a lot of that plan was discussed in Facebook, by the way. And somebody recently joined and was like, wow, Dave, it's really cool. I went back and looked at the archives. Like, you guys talk about a lot of cool stuff. And we do. And I'm a nerd, but it's awesome. So the buy was market on close. It's a little scary to buy a market on the close because it's like it almost feels like a leap of faith or it is a leap of faith. You're like, Jesus, this thing going to continue to follow through. I don't know. Am I buying this extended market? It's a bit of a Jackie Mason type of trade. But the buy was at 1290 market on close. The initial profit target was two points away. The stop was two points away. And then luckily, I guess there's not luck, there's skill, right? Because we found the setup we liked, we took the setup, we followed the plan, that's skill, not luck. But so far, so good. Check back often though, we have the stop to break even. Initial profit target was hit a few days ago. And since we've since then, we've given up some of those open profits. So what? I know. So what? Easier said than done. I have learned to care less and less about giving up those open profits because it comes with the territory. I'm not happy about it. Don't get me wrong. If I look at a screen too much, I'll cuss and fuss because I'll find myself mentally monetizing how much money I did have or do have and then watching some of it evaporate. But for the most part, if I can get to that initial profit target, my stops at break even, then I just leave things alone and let them unfold, let the chips fall where they may. If I get stopped out, so what? A 1% overall move in my portfolio in a couple of weeks is a pretty good deal. If I did that on every trade, I'd be doing pretty darn good. All right, big if, if you are a gold member of DaveLander.com, then please join the Facebook group. And it's going to ask you a question. It's going to ask you what email you use to sign up. And that will be verified. And once that's verified, we'll let you into the group. Now, every time I put this video out, I get 10 people want to be in a group. It's like, no, you have to be a gold member of DaveLandry.com. And that's to keep the riffraff out. I'm half kidding. <laughs> no, we got a great group so far. I'm pretty excited about the, the group. I am a nerd. Let me just show you real quick where the Facebook group is. Somebody said, Dave, I'm not on Facebook. I was like, well, I had my dog on Facebook, and I need to see if that account's still open. I used to bark to everybody's comment. If somebody would comment, I would say, rough. That's all I did with the dog. It drove a few people nuts, which was a shorter trip for many. But if you do go to the members area, davelander.com slash members, 
and right there, click on that Facebook group, to let you in. If you don't want to be on Facebook, which some of your older guys don't want to, hey, I don't blame you, you know? My wife makes fun of me because I've got like these huge long passwords. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, she gets she gets hacked every now and then, and I get hacked much less often. I did get hacked a few years back by the Russians, believe it or not, in a Yahoo account. But they worked really hard to hack me. Anyway, long story endless. I, I get why you might not want to be in Facebook, but join as under an alias and let me know who you are. If, if that's a problem. And again, that's the vast minority of you guys. And I probably shouldn't even beat the dead horse on that. But anyway, you click right there. All right, let's go ahead and get the charts shared. All right, first of all, S&P 500. I just said that we triggered a daily bow tie yesterday. By the way, somebody was asking me, it was about TQQQ, and I, this is again where the Facebook group comes in. I put out a post, everybody sees it. If you are to trade an opening gap reversal in something like the P's or something like TQQQQ, I would not trade it within this range here. Let me get a better pin color. What you want to do is let's say you come in, I guess now we'd be, now would be like down here. So we come in, let's say a few just get creamed overnight. Twitter war happens and whatever, real war happens, God forbid. Then you might look to play that opening gap reversal back up. If the market does rally up, and this is what I was hoping for a few days ago, but it didn't happen. I was hoping we get a big gap up here and then it became like a bit of a never, never mind and then the market began to sell off hard. I would not trade any gaps within this range. And I know a lot of you guys are anxious. And I see a few of you guys in the Facebook group trading small gaps and you're doing okay. Make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little. But I would only trade the opening gap reversals that are the best of the best out there. And one thing you want to do is you want to look for setups within the trend, for instance, like JNUG should we get a gap down. So I mentioned this last night. The service peeps didn't happen today, so I guess we could talk about it. But you get a case like, and I think I traded it on this day. If not, uh, I'm pretty sure I did. If you go look at the Facebook group, you'll find out for sure. But I like them when you have a nice trend, okay, and then you got like a TKO or something. Somebody was asking me, how do I know it's going to gap lower the next morning? I don't. But on his JNUG, when it sold off hard, it's in a serious trend. I knew the next day to look for, on the open, a possible gap lower. And this turned out to be a really nice opening gap reversal type of trade. I'd rather these than those against the trend. And as you can see, again, we could be setting up a, for a possible opening gap reversal here soon. Maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow might be the day. Now, I prefer trading them in the direction of the trend, but every now and then I call it a burning dog. I stole that line from Linda Rasky. But a few days back, I traded this one. And then a few days before that, I traded this one. And then I actually used the TMV. So I was like, came in like here. And then let's zoom in this chart a little bit, see if we can get rid of it a little. I can't make this go away. I know what it is. I just can't make this go away in, in this version of TC. But I traded this gap here, and then I traded this gap here. And then yesterday, we just didn't get that reversal, so the entry order was up here. Luckily, it didn't trigger. Came in today, I thought I was going to get the mother of all the opening gap reversals, but it rallied back up, and we got a very tiny gap on the open. It wasn't worth trading. Now, again, burning dog, still looking for Linda Rasky. That's your, you're putting your face in the fire with these trades, but it's only a day trade. And in a lot of cases, the risks aren't huge. Take a look at the NASDAQ. Same thing there. I was talking about the TQQQ. I have a chart in the Facebook group explaining the opening gaps there. But if you were to trade the opening gap reversals, don't trade them in the middle here. Trade them on the fringes in the NASDAQ. You can see NASDAQ a little weak today. So, so far, still looks like it could be a little bit of trouble. 
And again, back to our way out, as I've been saying quite a bit, my big concern is when a market can barely get past its prior peaks because a few big down days pulls it back in. Yeah, the overtrade, yeah, it's very much like, absolutely. It's it's uh, uh, Donald saying the overtrade looks very much like Larry Williams' oops. Absolutely. Yeah, Larry Williams, I think, traded those as part of uh, his winning the trading champ championship. There's nothing new under the sun. And Toby Crable has done a lot of that. Um, if you can get your hands on Toby Crable's book, it's a rare book. It's worth, I think it's like $3,000. But if you can get your hands on Toby Crable's book, uh, it might be worth studying his, he calls them opening range, opening range breakouts. So yeah, I'm not the first to have done the ogre trades. It's something that's just become a uh, part of what I do. In fact, I don't know, um, I don't even know exactly what Larry Williams was doing. I just traded in my own, my own fashion. You know, I did bow tie. I did, uh, what did I do? Uh, when I did the first Landry light, thing going all the way back to the 220 EMA breakout system. Somebody emailed me and said, that was back in 95. Somebody said, Guppy's doing a lot of stuff that, that you're doing. You know, you did you get that from Guppy? It's like, no, I didn't know who Guppy was. I would later meet him in Australia. I see him bumping into him whenever I travel the world. But anyway, long story endless. Yeah, there's nothing new under the sun. So yeah, it'd be interesting to, to see that. Yeah, Crable, Crable went on to do really well for himself and he's got a I was really blown away when I saw him speak in 95 I think it was he showed what impressed me then was he showed this this system that he was going to implement in six months I mean there's no way I could wait that long if I thought I had something that was viable and he showed his performance he showed his portfolio what he was doing his managed portfolio and he's like, and we think it's going to increase performance by 1% overall or whatever it was. When we begin to implement these new techniques six months from now, it's like, wow, the amount of discipline that he has to do something like that. So I was very blown away by him. But yeah, looks like Toby got kind of quiet once he got to, once he started running a bunch of money. It was it was cool back when he did the um, when back when he wrote that first book. Donald, you said lots of good stuff in Crable's book. Yeah, do you actually have the a hard copy of the book? So Nasdaq still looks like it could be a little bit of trouble. No, you got a PDF. Okay, gotcha. Where'd you get a PDF? Or should I ask? <laughs> if you tell me, would you have to kill me? You know, one thing interesting in the Rusty is let's back out to a weekly. If you've been following along in the service or in the Week of charts or in the members area, or if you passed in the streets and I was standing on the rooftop, shouting out the rooftop, my big concern with the Rusty was that we had this big picture retrace. And unlike the S&P and the NASDAQ, we never did make it back to new highs. And as I've been saying quite a bit, until and unless we take out that 161, 162 area, I'm gonna remain concerned about the Rusty. This is a weekly chart. Other thing that's kind of interesting here, weekly bow tie down. And you can see we've kind of flipped back and forth quite a bit with the bow ties. But as a general statement, that top remains in place until and unless you go on to make new highs when that comes off of all-time highs. Now, I've said this quite a bit, so go ahead and watch some weekly charts for a little bit more on that. Not that you want to stay short until you go back to new highs, but just remember that the sell signal is there. In more recent times, we've been a little wide and loose in the rusty, and now, as of today, we're banging out new lows for the year. But we're up since, but we're up since January. Yeah, but go back. How far could you go back in this darn thing? You can go back a long, long way. You can go all the way back to what? 2017. That's not a good thing. When well, you can go back several years in a market or a couple years in a market, and you haven't made any forward progress. Is it Tony or Toby? Toby, T-O-B-Y, did I say Tony? I have a lot of Tonys on the service. <laughs> All right, as you go through these sectors, you can see most of them look pretty ugly. How's that for an oxymoron from trend following moron? Energy's banging out new lows. In fact, while we're looking at energies, let's take a look at the dollar. 
You can see the dollars generally in an uptrend. We're banging out new multi-week highs here. Dollar up, commodities down as a general statement, okay? Before I forget, let's go back to bonds. The, the yield curve is inverted. The yield curve is inverted. You know what that means? It means within 10 years, we're going to have a recession. <laughs> you know, learn that stuff. And learn not to use that stuff or learn when to use it, I guess I should say. But learn for the most part not to use it. You can't time off of something like an inverted yield curve, okay? Markets have long lead and lag times to macroeconomics and to intermarket technical analysis. You do learn about all this stuff, but know when to use it. It only matters when it matters. Back to the sectors, I do like the golds and I do like the silver right now, the silvers. So I would continue to look for setups there. We have one we're looking to go after. And I have an order in place, not sure if it triggered. Now as you go through these sectors, one thing that's kind of interesting is consumer non-durables, which tend to be defensive stocks because people still have bodily functions in bear markets, those guys have been selling off too. So that's kind of interesting. That tells me there's a lot of selling in the market, or a lot of supply, I should say, would probably be a better way of putting it. Foods, another defensive area, people still have to eat in the bear market. Okay, drugs would be another one, which in general is a defensive area. Take a look at drugs. Drugs, not so high. Drugs that even make new highs with the overall market. So that's a little concerning. Now, I'm not going to bore you. Too late, I know. But just a couple more things to point out. Notice that retail was off to the races, but then came right back in. That's a testament for waiting for entries. And if you wait for a fairly liberal entry, you would have avoided that slide right back into the soup, the sideways soup, okay? I used to consult with the hedge fund and he called it the soup when the market was just chopping back and forth and had no direction he called it being in a soup that's where that came from and that's the problem with the nasdaq the sp and most of these sectors is that they got out of the soup and now they fell right back into the soup okay so a couple of more things hardware if you got hardware you need what you need software for your hardware hardware Selling down fairly hard, selling off fairly hard. Software, same sort of action there too. Both of these bow ties off of all time highs. Like the overall market, no big shocker there. Semiconductors, not looking so hot. Semiconductors tried to break out, but then came right back in. This is why you don't buy breakouts, FYI. All right, let's take a look at lots of stocks coming in. Let's start looking at these stocks. We should be able to get to all of them this week. Perry, this looks kind of interesting. It's a little bit on the thin side given the price of the stock. It's a little wide and loose longer term. Does have some problems, meaning, in other words, overhead supply. But I guess that'd be a good problem to have if it went all the way back up to the overhead supply. Let's zoom in a little bit. It's had a pretty extended run. Let's just see how see what happens when it pulls back. But I don't know. I wouldn't do anything just yet on that one. But yeah, it needs quite a pullback because it's had a pretty good run. It's ran up about 100%, so I would wait for a pretty serious pullback before even thinking about that. Apps. This looks okay. You can see that we sort of crawled along, we sort of crawled along, and then we began to sort of accelerate higher. It needs a little bit more knockout. Got good volume there. It's a little extended, though. It ran up about 600%, maybe even more. Maybe 800. Nope, 400%. 400% over a fairly short period of time. So I would maybe try to find something that hasn't ran so far so fast. But, yeah, let's see what happens with a pullback. We might, might be worth a second shot. AKG. AKG. This looks good. Now, it is a penny stock, okay, so be careful. But, yeah, this looks pretty damn good. I'm a little more lenient when it comes to gold stocks because they can be a little choppy. But I do like this one. I've been going through the golds every day. And it's got a little bit of overhead supply. 
But based on the volatility and based on the fact that gold's doing pretty good in here, absolutely. And I like the way it's bottomed out, okay? Again, penny stock, though, always a little dangerous with those guys. So take it with a big grain of salt. But, yeah, maybe entry, it's going to sound crazy, but entry at one, and you might have a stop, like, way down here at seven. It's only 30 cents, but don't bet the form on that. Don't bet any more than you would want to lose. I don't want to lose anything, you know? <laughs> People are like, how much do you want to lose? I don't want to lose anything. But, yeah, that's that's pretty good-looking stock. I like that. And I don't know what goals overall are doing, but um, if we're seeing a sell-off today, looks like the commodity is actually a little higher. If we're seeing a sell-off sell in those stocks, let's take a look at them real quick. Maybe we'll find some other ones there. But, hey, I like that. You know, let me give you a high five on that. Okay, if anyone has a subscription to Stocks and Commodities magazine, Crable wrote a series of articles back in the 90s that are worth reading. Thank you, Donald. Yeah, Stocks and Commodities, I used to have, I think I ended up throwing them, throwing them away. I had I had so much material in my, uh, in my office, but I probably had all those Stocks and Commodities. I think you can get a CD from Stocks and Commodities with all those old um, magazines. I have it read it in a while my wife used to renew it every year for me and we just didn't get around to it last few years she used to say dance with the one that brought you dance with, dance with the one that brung you what's the saying my whole career was launched from a stocks and commodities article in 1995 a guy starting a hedge fund hired me on and then he hired on another guy who already had a hedge fund and then it's like then this one guy liked what I wrote, who was a CTA, and said that I should send a re resume to Larry Connors, tell Larry Connors that I would uh, be do some would be willing to do some consulting, and then Larry Connors had hired me on as a consultant, and then everything kind of started from there. He started a website soon thereafter, trading markets, and then ended up writing with trading markets, and so on and so forth. But yeah, it all started in the 90s with that. But yeah, we might have to, that might be a good thing to look into. And Toby Crable stuff. Super nice guy. PVG looks good. I don't know what kind of metals it is. Anybody know? Sometimes these metal and mining stocks, they scoop up more than just gold or whatever they're going after when they're digging in the ground. And this needs more than a uh, pretty good knockout, though. It's pretty good, uh, pretty good run. By knockout, I mean it needs to get pretty good pullback. It is a little wide and loose longer term, though. Maybe find something a little cleaner that um, whatever that little gold stock was a little while ago. Let's see if we could find it. AKG has been trading more cleanly in more recent times. And then also longer term, it's kind of bottomed out in here. Still a little wide and loose, so I, I'm a little bit wider than I remembered. But I prefer going out to something like AKG, a little bit lower levels, a little bit more bigger base in place. Okay, any more? Well, while we're in impasse, I want to thank all you guys and girls for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered again, I'll either cover it in one of these sessions. If you're a gold member, I'll cover it in the Q&A. And if you want, you can also ask in the Facebook group. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thanks again to all you guys and girls for attending me. Thank you so much. Good luck, and uh, may the trend be with you.